The first night I talked about words of knowledge and their purpose and how they were tied. They were a revelation gift tied to giving us an understanding that it is the will of God to do these things. But, he's, but what I didn't talk about is he looks to see if there is a confirmation. He looks to see if there's an amen on our part, um, which is very important. You say, well, how can I have, there was a word of knowledge, but the person didn't get healed. One thing is that they don't understand its purpose. If you don't understand the purpose of word of knowledge, you can create curiosity. How do they know that? But it doesn't build faith. It's in the teaching of, that helps people to understand that that is what God wants to. It is his will to do it. And if you understand the scripture and understand the promises of God, you know that if we know something according to his will, we know that he's heard us and what we ask and we see that which we ask. That's a paraphrase of 1 John 5, 14. It's in the knowledge of its purpose that the revelatory gift creates a higher measure of faith or sometimes even a gift of faith which releases then the cause effect of the gift of healing. Now, in 2 Corinthians, in chapter uh, 1, and uh, beginning in verse 18... But verse 20 is going to be the most important verse. I'll, I'll tell you when we get there. But as surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is preached among you and me uh, and Silas and Timothy, was not yes and no. But in him, it has always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so, this is the key here. The promises. God is not a man that he should lie. If he says he wants to do something, it's yes. It's not yes and no, it's yes. In him, it's yes. But verse 20 says, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so, through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Do you remember me teaching this afternoon that God receives glory by what he does and the testimony of what he does? So it's in the finding the agreement in the people who will say the amen. Not, it's not a magical talisman. It's just the amen or in Jesus' name. It's not, I don't mean it that way. It's, it's that in our heart we're saying, yes. So be it. Let it be. It is in that amen spoken by us, which is a plural, not a singular. Which I believe that when the church gets a hold of this, we will move from what presently is too much the case. Everybody's listening for a word for their problem. Paying attention for their need. Wanting to believe for their healing. And we fail to understand that the scriptures much more speaks about community than it does individuals. And it addresses the, the corporate body. And what we're talking about, I believe we'll see greater miracles when the church gets an understanding that I need to stay engaged and focused and responsive and adding my faith to their faith. For any word that's coming out because we are one body. And when there's not an individual, yes, in the heart, an expectant faith, yes. But a corporate, amen. We'll begin to see healings become miracles and we'll see more healings. So may we all stay focused and adding our faith to their faith for them. May we be like the four men who let their friend down through the ceiling. And it says, Jesus seen their faith. Didn't say his faith, their faith. Yes. Now, I don't want to repeat, but I know that a lot of you weren't here that first night. And when we talked about healing, it was uh, faith is connected to uh, declarations. Like we've said the last two nights, we believe there'd be at least 60 healed if it's a better than average meeting. 
And if it's an average meeting, it'd be at least 10% or 30 people get healed um, if, there, if we had a, a pretty much full house. Last night, there were 78 healed in total, counting from the platform and during across the front. Um, the night before was 60 some odd, I think, 59, uh, close to the uh, 60. And I don't think that included the team, the, the church's local team added in, if I remember right. But I'm believing for 60 people, not a, not a good service. I'm believing for a better than average service. I think we need to believe going from faith to faith, from glory to glory, to expect more tonight than we did on the first night, to expect the same thing, unless we're running out of things to heal. And I don't think that's the case. <laughs> that's why sometimes you can have so many healings in comparison to the numbers of people because there are people who have five, six different things wrong with them. <laughs> As a matter of fact, sometimes we'll ask, how many, how many things were you healed of? Raise your hand instead of just wave your hand. Put your fingers up. If you had more than one healing, <laughs> tell us how many you had. And went, already? T tonight or this whole week? She has, she's been healed of four things. He's been healed of three things. We didn't, we, uh, two things. We, we, we didn't ask her to find that out. But healing is also by power of the testimony, which is last night's message. Um, tonight, we want to not talk about the purpose of a word of knowledge. We worked a whole night to establish that. Uh, I believe that my role when I come into a church is to really equip the saints for the work of ministry. And so I want to spend tonight uh, on telling you how to recognize when you're getting a word of knowledge. And at the end, I'm going to give you a chance to find out if you were right or not. Now, how many of you believe that Pentecostals ought to be as anointed as Presbyterians? <laughs> now, if you believe that... Lift your hands. That I believe we ought to be as anointed as, as Presbyterians are. At, no, no, at least as anointed. You know, I don't mean equal to, but, you, you know, at least that level of anointing. Huh? Some of you aren't sure? <laughs> now, I said that for this reason. I was at a Presbyterian church. 10,000 member Presbyterian church in Brazil. And I taught on word of knowledge. And I said, some of you are going to give your first word of knowledge. And I, actually, I said this on the first part of the call. If you've given words of knowledge before, you can't give it tonight. In any way you've ever given a word of knowledge before. But if you are having to risk with a word of knowledge in a way you have never received, it's the very first time to get a word like that then you can participate. I was expecting 20 people to come up. There was 10,000 members, but the church had only seated about 2,500, 3,000. And uh, uh, I knew what I was going to preach I, after the 20 people gave their words of knowledge. And I even said, I'd like for 20 of you to come up. Who's never give a word, given a word of knowledge in your life. 200 people got up and came to the front. And I thought, well, there goes the sermon. <laughs> 200 people who had never given a word of knowledge, and they were all Presbyterians. This is their first time. Only one missed. Some of them were so accurate, they had the name of the person and what was wrong with the person. I mean, that's amazing. Some of them, the, when they gave the word, their first time to ever give a word of knowledge, and this is what's so important, you need to know if you have it and don't stand up, not just tonight, but anytime you're in a church and somebody gives a word of knowledge and there's, there's indication for you to respond. If you don't, 
you are actually doing a great disservice to the church. You're hurting that person. You're confusing that person. Because if they give it and you don't stand up and you have it, they think they missed. And that causes them to feel like I can't trust that way I just had it. That, that, was not, that was not God. When it really was. The confusion that's caused. The, the people cannot grow if there's not a feedback loop. It's not good just to get up and give words and say, oh, and then everybody come up. They need to know if they were right or not. Always. So the people stood up. I, I talked to them about it. And, and they really, they honored it. And they honored each other. And they did the loving thing, not the selfish thing. I have a pet peeve. One of my pet peeves. And people have a word of knowledge won't stand up. They're quenching the spirit, grieving the spirit. It's selfish. It's cowardly. And I think it's wrong. That's just my opinion. <laughs> my humble opinion. But I do think there's no excuse for that. And I think anything that causes you to sit there and not stand up, if you actually have what's called out, even if you're, not, if you're here and you're not even saved, it doesn't make any difference. God can say, God can heal you. And then he, then he probably wants, you'll probably want him to save you after he heals you. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was in a meeting once, this is off subject. This is a rabbit I'm going to let out of the cage. Uh, but I was in a meeting once at a Paz church, Peace Church in um, uh, Sao Paulo area. And and I don't, I don't even know if this is right to do. As a matter of fact, I even said it. You know, that thought, I don't even know if this is correct. But I want you to see the power of the name of Jesus. And so, uh, if you, even if you're not a Christian, I want you to see the power of the name of Jesus. Everybody that needs to be healed, stand up. And a lot of people stood up and said, now, if you're st- Standing by somebody that stood up, even if you're not a Christian. I just, I, I, this is the part I'm not sure is right. But anyway, it, it, Celtic Christianity, let the sinners hang out with the saints and let the sinners go heal the sick with the, with the Christians. And uh, unlike Roman Catholicism, Celtic uh, Catholicism was, was, was quite different. You come hang out with us first, do what we're doing, see the power of God, see the quality of our love, see the quality of our community, and it would draw them in. And so I thought, well, at least I got that to go with. Anyway, this woman, I didn't know she was a witch. In, not a witch. She was in Macumba, which is a cult. She wasn't like a witch. But she was in Macumba. And Macumba is a mixture of Catholicism and witchcraft. And it's, it's, it's not a good thing. Well, this woman, she's a high up in, person in Macumba. And so she, and she <laughs> was sitting on right where Elizabeth, we're kind of where you're at, right in that area, uh, second row, on, third from the end. And the person next to her stood up. And so this Macumba priestess stands up and she says, in the name of Jesus, she's praying for the person to get healed in Jesus' name. And I just wanted him to see it. And the, and the demon in her manifested, knocked her down. And she's shaking. And it wasn't God. It was the demonic thing. And she gets up and she puts her own hands on her head. And she says, in the name of Jesus, you bad spirit, get out of me. And she's, now she's manifesting really, really bad. And they carry her out and cast the demon out of her and bring her back. That it, it worked. She saw the authority of the name of Jesus. She saw the authority and the power of Jesus' name. I mean, that was a weird night because not only did that happen, we saw a woman on her back just fly across the floor, like from there all the way to the wall. Just, just like, I was like, what was that? And we saw all types of, stirred up a bunch of stuff. And we got them free. We, 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 we should have offered discount for wholesale, you know. Uh, it's like that person's not traveling alone. <laughs> give them, <laughs> you know, give her a group discount. <laughs> anyway, back to the Presbyterian church. So the people who have never given a word of knowledge in their life, 
Some of them were so accurate. The moment they gave the word, that word was so accurate. The person instantly raised their hand and started waiting. They were healed instantly. And the person who gave it when they saw that started weeping instantly. So touched that what they just got from God resulted in an instantaneous healing. That church will never be the same. How do you get a word of knowledge? You can feel a pain that's not your pain. It's a sympathetic pain. This is one of the two most common ways to get a word of knowledge for the West. Like America and Europe. So one, of the most, one of the two most common ways is you feel a pain, it's not your pain, which is really neat because you can be exact. And if your pain is right here, don't say it pain in the back. Don't even say pain in the lower back because the more exact you are, the more precise you are, the more faith it builds. And also be, be quick in how you give them. We don't care when you got it, while you were teaching, on the way here, um, during the two-minute prayer, we don't care how, when you got it. Only thing it would be is be succinct, be short, and be precise. And I saw, I felt, so I felt a pain. You can tell what it feels like. Is it a dull pain? Is it a jabbing pain? Is it an achy pain? Is it, does it radiate um, um, and exactly where it's at? If you feel it, you got all that. You can be very precise. If you see a word of knowledge, it's like you may see an organ. For example, my wife one time gave a word in the Presbyterian church we're doing a healing meeting at. Um, and it was a, a kidney. And there's a 10 year old girl that she got healed of a rare kidney disease. We know that because she came back later and told us, confirmed it. She, she was healed. But on the way home, because we were learning, this is like I did my first healing. I did my first healing teaching, healing school, seminar called them, within one month of my own church being touched for the first time by the power of the Spirit. I, just like, I felt like you get to keep what you give away. And I wanted to, and, 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 and the, I wanted to keep it. And the, the Presbyterian pastor became one of the first vineyard pastors in southern Illinois. And he told me, I saw more in those one night a week for 10 weeks. I saw more in those 10 nights. I've seen my whole 16 years of being a pastor combined. And I just got to be part of, of what you're doing. And uh, he's gone home to be with the Lord now. But anyway, uh, it was an, to, an exciting thing. So on the way back... I had friends with me. We were all still in the Baptist church, actually, at the time. And, uh, and we would interview each other. How did you get that word? Did you feel it? Did you think it? Did you see it? Did you read it? Did you say it? Now I know, did you experience it or did you dream it? There's actually seven ways. At that time, I only, I only knew of five. And uh, so my wife said, I saw it. Now, I know my wife. And I know she would flunk human anatomy. <laughs> and I said, well, how did you know what you were looking at was a kidney? And she said, I didn't know what it was. I saw it. And I said, God, what's that? <laughs> and then I had this strong impression, kidney. So it was actually a combination of two. Matter of fact, this is bizarre, and I, I shouldn't even tell this one, but I will. <laughs> we had an elderly lady, not an elderly lady, but an older lady. Now that I'm 65, almost 66, elderly is a different number than it used to be. <laughs> <clears throat> now, elderly is at least 85. You know, you, you, know, you, you, know, you know how an old person is? It's, it's like 10 years past you, you know, or <laughs> but it's not you. <laughs> anyway, there's this older woman. I would say that she was um, in her late 70s. And this was her word of knowledge. I see a banana hanging on a string in the middle of the kitchen. And I'm thinking, she missed it. <laughs> well, we're going to have to talk to her a little bit and help her out. And a woman stood up, un, uh, uh, um, not a Christian, and she said, it's me. And we found out later, in search of her healing, she had gone to a Macumba and they had told her, if you want to be healed, 
tie a banana on a string and hang it in the middle of your kitchen. And she had done it. She said, that's me. And now she hadn't been healed. Now she gets healed in the name of Jesus. And then she gives her life to Jesus. And I'm thinking, wow, that woman, she's amazing. <laughs> she went, I need to teach her, so I need her to teach me, you know. A little bit later, she says, I see this house is painted pink, and you got these light flowers and these little vases on the front, and everyone says, that's my house. <laughs> In the video I'm going to show you tonight, one of the things that I pointed out to you, there was an African-American guy who was in our school. Uh, it was their first time. Uh, the school just started. They'd had one teaching on word of knowledge, only one, and now they're um, learning to give words of knowledge, and we were at this big Baptist church. And this guy said, mechanic, radiator. And my executive director and I, we looked at each other and said, we're going to have to talk to him and help him around, you know, <laughs> give him a little more instruction. Because <laughs> we were sure he missed it. And on the video tonight, you'll see a dark-complected man with a white T-shirt on. You will not get to hear his testimony, but you'll see him standing here as someone else is giving their testimony. In the Portuguese version of this, which because he only did it in Portuguese, didn't, we didn't get the English. He came up and he testified, I'm a mechanic. This morning I was working on a radiator. The radiator exploded and it burned my hand so bad I've not been able to close my hands. And the moment that young man said that instantly, I was healed. And we thought. We don't need to teach him. So after I, after I explain what words of knowledge are. And how to pray for the sick. We're going to have you give words of knowledge. And first of all. Those of you. Um. Those of you who have never had a word of knowledge. Now, in a way, like I say, I, 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 every word of knowledge, I've, I've felt it. You can't do it if you feel it tonight. Save it for tomorrow. But if you, impression, if it's some way you've never had. I want everybody to be at the same place. Everybody that gives a word of knowledge tonight, you say, I've never given a word of knowledge in this way. I, too, am risking. It's kind of like, let's grow. Let's grow. So well, number one, you can feel pain. It's not your pain. Number two, you can think it. So would you say this after me? You can feel it. Feel it. Or you can think it. Think it. It's an impression. It's an impression. When I first heard about words of knowledge, if I felt them, I was 90% accurate from the very beginning. If I thought them, I was 25%. So what did I do? I made a mistake. Within a month, I said, why, give a, why take a chance on missing when you're so accurate with feeling them? I shut down and would not give impressions. Whatever you don't lose, you, whatever you don't use, you lose. When I, because I was so accurate. If I had an impression, I mean, a, a feeling, if I felt the pain. I never saw anything for a long, long time. Um... Because if I had a pain, I was only 32 years old. I had no pains in my body. And so if I got a pain, it was accurate. When I hit 50, <laughs> I told the Lord, Lord, I can perceive that this accuracy level is going to start going down. <laughs> because it seems like I'm getting new pains all the time. And I'm going to have trouble knowing, well, was that just one of those growing pains, or growing older pains? Or is that... So, Lord, we need to work on developing other ways so that when I am older and have lots of pains in my body, I can still get words of knowledge. <laughs> now, I would say that impressions is about 75% accurate. But I had to be willing to miss, to learn, to discern, to grow. Amen. So you can feel them, you can think them. Say it. You can feel them, you can think them. You can see them. Now, this is like two ways. The more common way is like a mental, not impression, but mental picture. Like a daydream. 
It can, be a, it can be a flash. It can be very fast. It can be longer. You may see it quite a while. You may see it, instead of a still picture, you may see a little video. In the first month after my church was touched, my assistant pastor who went with me to start the vineyard uh, was a coal miner, full-time, and he volunteer assistant pastor. Uh, he became one of my elders. He, he and his wife was a special needs school teacher. They were very gifted at seeing things, seeing pictures, seeing videos. So one day, within a month of the, the initial very first teaching ever hearing about this, we're, we're having church on Sunday morning, and he sees an 11 year old. Um, 11 or 12 year old, I think it was 12 year old boy. He said he knew it was a young uh, preteen. And he's naked. And as he looks at this naked boy, the left side muscles all began to wither to where they, they were just withering, withering, withering. And as he continued to watch the video, it wasn't like a still, it was actually a video. The, the, the side, the right side began to wither. Now, he didn't know how to interpret it. I mean, this is like within the first three or four Sundays of the new church we're starting. He doesn't, does this mean our church is going to do that? Or is this about a person? How do I interpret it? So he didn't say anything. He didn't know what to do with it. Never had anything like that. That afternoon, he went home with uh, to where his five and six brothers and sisters had met it to their parents. And during just socializing, not no worship, nothing going on, here come again. The same vision. Clear as day, exact same thing. He didn't know what to do with it. Came to church that night, and during worship, here it came a third time. Now, this time he's undone. He came to me, he's really undone by this. He said, I don't know what to do with it. I didn't know what to do with it either. And so I said, we don't know how to interpret this. And so we told what he saw. We had a visitor there that night from another church, a holiness church, Church of God Anderson. And she said, I know who that is. That's Lincoln also. He's 11, 12 years old. He has a rare disease. He's been to the Shriners. It's affecting the muscles that are withering. Literally, it's right. His muscles on the right side of his body are withering. withering, And the doctor said it, the disease is going to come over onto the right side. And eventually, it's going to kill him. And he's scheduled to go back to Shriners tomorrow. Morning, Monday. And then she said, his mother thinks you guys are a cult. And she wouldn't bring him here. But I know her. And we stopped the service. And we went outside and called the mother and gave the phone to her friend from the church. And she explained everything she had said since she said, because the, the, the holiness churches do believe in healing. They may not have practiced it for a while, some of them. But they believe in it. And she says, I know you believe in healing. Lay your hands on your son. I want you to agree with us. And I asked the whole church, let's, let's, let's intercede for Lincoln. And we prayed. And Lincoln went the next day to Shriners. And he came out and said, we don't know how to explain this. But that disease is not coming over to the right side and his muscles are beginning to regenerate on his left side. And he was totally healed. And we didn't understand it or how to do it. But, but it's kind of like we're willing to be vulnerable. Willing to step out and go for it. So you can feel them. Would you say it? You can feel them. Think them. See them. Feel them. Think them. It's an impression. See them mental picture second way of seeing is an open vision this is rare mental pictures are very common open visions are not open vision is matter of fact I've I don't think I've ever had a full open vision you would disappear I wouldn't see you anymore and I would see just like watching a big screen tv you're gone and my whole vision is on this thing this Blocked you out. It's literally not in your mind. Somehow it's like you're seeing it. 
So you can feel them, you can think, you can see them, you can read them. How's that work? Never had it. I have to ask others how it works. Like my coal miner friend. Because he had that. Like John. Remember John? Help me, Randy. Help me, Randy. Remember John? The civil engineer that was so powerfully touched. He saw so much. As a matter of fact, within, one, within the first month, he was awakened from sleep with feeling like he's being strangled. And when he woke up, he, this strangling on his neck, and we're supposed to go pray for a deliverance the next day. And this is strangling him. is our first time to pray for somebody for deliverance ever. Uh, in intentional, and one, we'd had one other person, or person, the cousin, the person had it. And he fears in the room, coldness is in the room. And he finally is able to say the name Jesus. And when he's able to say the name Jesus, it's just totally it's gone. And he goes into an open vision. And he sees this woman who we've never met. He sees her when she's 23 years younger. She's 39 when she's 16. He sees the name of the green sign. In Illinois, there are green signs, the name of the towns. He sees the name of the town, the name of it. And then he sees her in the back seat. He sees the kind of car. And he, God gives him the name of the man who raped her in the back seat of that certain model of car. And the man's name who raped her when she is 16 years old. Turns out later, her mother told her, don't you ever talk about that to anybody again in your life. And the only people knew it was her mother and her cousin. And her cousin was the person whose person was delivered. And when we're there to start praying for, John starts telling her about a thing. And I think, how does he know this? It was all by a vision. Now, that type of vision is really rare. But the mental picture is, is, is quite common. So you can feel them, you can think, you can see them, you can read them. By the way, she got healed real fast and got delivered real quick uh, through the information. But the other thing, this to show you how you got to discern... John, after he is so right on everything, and, and even the names of the two demons that were in her, uh, it was all right. And then he said, and I know about your adultery. And she said, I didn't commit adultery. And he said, you did too. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. You committed adultery. She said, well, I mean, he's like a month old in the Lord in these things. He doesn't know what he's doing, and I didn't know either. You know, I mean, you know I'm, I'm the same length of time. He said, yes, you did. I heard the word adultery. And then she said, it wasn't me. It was my husband. I caught him in the garage last month with a 16-year-old girl, and I wanted to take the shotgun and shoot the B word. <laughs> and then John said, oh, excuse me. Excuse me. I just, I just interpreted it wrong. I, I heard the word, and I thought it was you. And he learned. When they say, no, it's not me, you better pay attention. Because <laughs> you maybe have misinterpreted the revelation, the right revelation, wrong interpretation. So you can feel them, you can think them, you can see them, uh, you can read them. So John and this Baptist woman from another Baptist church, we went to do, back to that Presbyterian church, and they came up to me, and, and uh, uh, John said, Hey, Randy, yeah, you see that man over there? He looked like a lumberjack, big, you know, Raleigh guy. I mean, you know, he, he didn't have weak wrist or anything. You know, he's just big, strong guy. You'd think he was a lumberjack. He said, he's a homosexual. I said, because there's no tip off in the natural. I said, how do you know that? He said, I see the word written on him, homosexual. And he said, what do you want me to do? And I said, nothing. <laughs> don't do anything. I don't know what to do, but don't do anything yet. And a little bit later, the, a woman from a sister Baptist church, she came up, who's a teacher. She said, Randy, yeah. You see that guy over there? Same guy. I said, uh-huh. He said, he's gay. 
I said, how do you know that? I said, I see the word written. The other one was on the back. This one was on the chest, like, you know, Mr. Universe. It said Mr. Gay, you know. No, it just said gay. What do you want me to do? And then I said, uh, I'd like for you and John to go to him together. And then take him somewhere private. Not in the middle. Don't let anybody hear what you say. And just ask him a question. Don't accuse him. Ask him a question. Just ask him if he struggles with his sexual identity. Make it a question rather than a... Let him uncover himself rather than you uncover him. And the guy broke into tears and said, yes. And then when he said yes, God took John into more vision. And John saw his brother was the person with whom he first had these types of acts. He says, is that right? And the man said, yes. And then John saw that his mother had actually put his brother up to it and said, is that true? And the man said, yes. And then God showed him something else. And he asked and the man, he, sometimes people aren't willing to go any deeper. Sometimes what you're dealing with is so painful, they want to stop. Don't push past where they're ready to go. Don't feel like you need to be so right that you do damage to them. Because sometimes, I, I remembered I was praying for my, my daughter's best friend. And she's about 11 years old. And I, she was adopted when she was about uh, two years old. Her mom and dad had a divorce. Her, her stepdad adopted her. And, uh, and all, I'm praying for her. And I hear that all I heard was the word teddy bear. And it's real clear. And her name was Andrea. I said, Andrea, does this mean anything to you, teddy bear? She said, no. I said, are you sure? Think about it. Does teddy bear, it doesn't mean anything. No. A year later or two, she came up to me. And she said, you know, Randy, do you remember the time you asked me if the word teddy bear meant anything to me and I told you it didn't I said yes I remember that so I lied to you that's the only memory I have of my biological father that was his pet name for me his little teddy bear you see God was wanting to do some healing inner healing in her but she wasn't ready but she never forgot that God had re revealed it and when she was ready then we dealt with it. So you can feel them. You can thank them. You can see them. You can read them. Um, you can say them. How does that happen? It's while you're talking. It's while you're praying often. You'll hear yourself say something, pray something. And as you, if you pray with your eyes open when you're praying for the sick. And when you say it or pray it, you see the effect on her body. Either Sometimes it'll be tears. Sometimes it, it, it'll be this, this, this um, like the furrowing of the brow. And like that really, it's the tensing of the body. And as you watch the body respond to what you're saying, you know, you just hit something. And sometimes you may come back and say, well, does, that, does that mean anything to you? And, and, and what really, happens, like for example, common illustration for me is, one I heard Blaine Cook give was, uh, you're praying for somebody and you hear yourself say, and Lord help him to forgive his second cousin who stole $20 from him when he was seven years old. And you're thinking, where'd that come from? Let me get that back. And the, but the guy starts crying. How did you know that? I didn't. I heard it when you did. Automatic speech. Unusual experiences, I don't have time to go into that one, and, but it's just God gives you the mean, an understanding of how to read an unusual coincidence or something with an understanding of it. Number seven, dreams. I was interviewing three guys that raised the dead in Mozambique in um, Pimba, and after I spent two hours on getting their dead raising stories I, uh, on video, I said... Uh, I know you guys do, but I'm just curious. How do you get your words of knowledge? Do you feel them, think them, see them, read them, say them, experience them? 
And he said, well, we get some like that, but that's not the way we get most of our words of knowledge. Now, this is the African continent, at least in Mozambique. I said, okay, I don't know of any other ways. He said, we dream them. And I said, well, I said, how's that work? So we have a dream, and then we see ourselves in real life, in the very thing we saw in the dream, and we know what comes next. And we know what to do. So two weeks after I heard about you can have a dream, I'm in Brazil. Two weeks later, I've been in Mozambique. Now I'm in Brazil, and I have a dream. And I see two hands like that. That's all. But the hand has something stuck in from here to here, sticking out two inches past the palm. Nobody, it, you know, like, like a diamond on a black velvet, that's just the two hands and that's all I see. I had never had a word of knowledge like that, so I'm not sure it's God. And I had just heard. So I, 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 I gave it. I saved it for last in case it was wrong. And I said, this is what I saw. Does that make sense to anybody? A guy jumps up on the back row and runs around. His hands like this. You can see a scar from here all the way around to here. It's a really terrible rough scar where it's not like it wasn't a surgery. It was like there was an accident that tore up his hand. And I found out later the guy's hand was paralyzed open. It was very sensitive. There's nerve damage. There's tendon damage. There'd been artery damage. Lots of damage. And he'd actually had a sliver of wood about that wide. It went into his hand and stuck out two inches past his wrist. He said, I knew that was me. And he came up and he put his hand in mine. And before I could say, come Holy Spirit, he's already healed. Amen. And I thought, wow, God, that's easy. That was so easy. That created so much faith. Give me more of those. Give me more of those. <laughs> I, I had three young interns, all, a 28, a 19, and a 19. Or 19, a 20, and a 28-year-old. And one of them was a woman uh, who has her own ministry today, Annie Byrne. And I gathered these three together, and I said, listen, I told them what I just told you. So pay attention to your dreams. The next day during ministry time, Annie did not give her dream. She was afraid she'd be wrong. Because it happened the very night, I said, pay attention to your dreams. God didn't wait a week, two weeks, a month, a year. It was that very night. This is what she dreamed. She saw a man walking down a big aisle like Sam's or, yeah, like Sam's Club. High, high, high with stuff or, or a Home Depot, one of those. They got them stacked up high. And this man, he's walking down this aisle and a box, high up box, falls off, hits him on the head, and she hears in a dream, pop, pop, pop. And then she wakes up. But she doesn't give it because she thinks this is probably just a dream. But God in his sovereignty arranges that in her line, there's about 80 of us, and most of everybody had, you know, 20 to 50 people to pray for. And in her line, this guy comes up to her, and the first thing you do in our five-step prayer model is interview and find out what's wrong. During the interview, the man says, I work at a warehouse, and I was walking down this aisle, and there's this big wooden box somehow fell off and hit me on the head and broke my neck and broke my back in two places. So he had three breaks. Do you think that encouraged her faith? She asked him, please, please, forgive me. I got to tell you something. I didn't even give it because I didn't think it was God. But I had a dream about you last night. I dreamed that that happened. I dreamed that there were three pops. You're the man. And his faith, even though she didn't give it publicly because she was in the right, he, was, he was in the right line that she had it when she told him the story, it still created faith. And the guy had just had his stitches taken out, had metal put in, lots of metal, and he he couldn't move his neck certain ways. He had uh, pain going down his legs. Everything gets healed. Woo! Everything gets healed because the word created faith. Now, those are seven ways you can get a word of knowledge. Now, how do we pray for the sick? Real quick. Number one is you're going to interview them. And you're going to do this tonight. Not only are the people up front going to do it, you're going to do it. 
And I, I'm going to ask you, regardless of how you pray, you can pray any way you want, except tonight. I'm going to ask you, will you try this? I have had so many people, including pastors, that said, when I just tried this simple way, because a lot of people say, I just don't know how to start. I don't know where to start. It, it, it's, it's not the only way to pray. There's times you can't use it like in India. If you've got 100,000 people, if you stop long enough to pray that way, right, they'll crush each other trying to up against the thing. So you can just walk by and touch them, basically. There's not every, it's not in every situation, but it's a good way to get started. Interview. In the interview, you want to ask questions. You also want to help them to become comfortable with what you're going to do so they have some understanding. You find out what their name is so you can be personal. Find out what the issue is because you can't speak to the condition if you don't know what the condition is. And when somebody, when I ask them, what do you want to be prayed for? You just ask the Lord and let him tell you what to pray for. I can't stand that. I can't stand that. I hate it when people do that. I don't hate them, but I just hate that situation. That's hyper-spirituality. Even Jesus asked people what was going on. How long has he had this? You know, the, to the man whose son was demon. How long has he had this? Uh, to the man who he prayed for, who was blind. And then he stopped and asked him, what do you see? I see men like trees walking. So he prayed again. So it's all right to ask questions. Because you want to find out. If you're going to pray... Sec, the second thing after the interview, well, wait, in the interview, also tell them, you know, if, if uh, I don't want you to pray while I'm praying for you. You can pray all you want before I pray. You can pray all you want after I pray. But while I'm praying for you, I don't want you to pray because that actually makes healing harder. My experience and a lot of other people have told me the same thing. If you've prayed for years for that condition, it won't hurt for you to be still for a few minutes because... Sometimes in the praying, we're still thinking about the future. I said, I, I want you to expect it now. So I want you to pay attention to your body. And I want you to tell me if you feel anything different. If it gets worse, your pain gets worse, your pain moves. If the pain moves or gets worse, when you pray, it's almost always a, a spirit of affliction. And even that should be encouraging to you. If they feel heat or energy, you say, you may feel something. For example, you may feel heat or energy. That's the most common thing. But a little less than 50% of the time, people don't feel anything. And they don't know they've been healed until they try to do what they can't. So you kind of let them know that. Because if they don't know to be looking or paying attention, they're not going to be able to participate. And, and, and a lot of times people will not interrupt you. So you can say, you can interrupt me. Don't wait till I ask you. And many times, even though you say that, they won't. So don't pray too long. Don't pray too long. Stop. Ask, what's happening? So you're going to make, a, in the interview, a diagnostic decision and a prayer selection. And in that diagnostic decision, it's based upon, okay, when did this start? In the, did, um, did anything traumatic happen in your life two or three years before this started? Do you have any huge trauma? Because often there's a connection between traumatic things that's happened and the physical problem. We're talking about psychosomatic illness. Did you know that the medical field says that 80% of all causes of physical problems in the clinics and hospitals has a root in a psychosomatic cause? Which means, basically, that's just a medical term that means this. We are not responding in a biblical way to being sinned against. We're not responding. Paul said, do not let the sun set on your anger. There's, 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 there's books by doctors doctor, um, that's, that's called toxic emotions. There are things that we know that if we have certain, if we allow certain hate, it's like the, the, works of the, of the, the works of the flesh, but hatred and bitterness and unforgiveness are emotions that will kill you. These emotions... If we allow them, and people sometimes do, uh, and their life is characterized by it, these emotions literally causes your, emo your immune system to be compromised. And because your immune system is compromised, you have disease. And so if that's the case, 
we need to pray for a healing and, a, and, and working through sometimes an inner healing and forgiveness. Forgiveness is a big deal. Forgiving people. Sometimes we see as soon as they forgive, bam, the, the healing comes. And so do I pray a prayer where I need to start with inner healing? Is it a natural cause? Did they have an accident? If it's a natural cause, don't ask them to repent for something. Don't get so spiritual that people's got to repent for something. Or don't make everything a demon. Do you ever play golf? I wanted to play on a golf course once. They saw how bad it was. I was. They wouldn't let me out there. They had to go over here on this, this other course because I was really good at digging holes every time I, I'd missed the ball. Uh, but anyway, with playing golf, you don't want to play golf with only one club. If everything in your sense is a demon, you've got one club. And that club may work really good if you're dealing with a demon, but that club doesn't work good. Help me put it this way. You can't cast out a hurt feeling, and you can't do inner healing on a demon. And some problems are demonic. Some problems are psychosomatic, emotional, rooted in emotion and bad emotions. And some problems are just a natural cause, such as an accident or genetic cause or some is a natural cause of just aging. You're just aging. And so make a distinction. Don't get so you know, hyper-spiritual. So you're going to try and make a diagnosis based upon them of how to approach this. And then pray for effect. And you may start out and say, I don't really know. Just say, and it's all right to have petitionary and commanding prayers mixed. The petitionary prayer is like, come Holy Spirit, uh, Lord, come, show us how to pray. Uh, that's all right. Pray it out loud if you want. Uh, Lord, we bless them. Come, Holy, send your angels. Oh, uh, that, that's, that's petitionary. But don't, before you finish praying, you need to get into commanding prayer because every prayer for healing in the New Testament is a commanding prayer. And there is not one inner, a petitionary prayer in the New Testament that's recorded when somebody got healed. Most of the times, we don't make commanding prayers because we feel like confusion. It sounds like I'm commanding God. No, you're not commanding God. You're commanding the body to respond to what you believe God wants you to say to it. You're using your authority. Yeah. One time I was in a Baptist church in Brazil, and I, I got this certain word of knowledge. Let's say it's the right, uh, right elbow. And it hurt, and I got this word of knowledge. And so I said, God, I ask you to heal the right. And I realized what I was doing. And I stopped. And I said, oh, God, forgive me. Forgive me for not honoring what you just told me. You see, if God just showed you he, the, a, a, a right elbow, you don't ask him to heal it. He showed you that because he wants you to speak in, his, in the authority that he's given you. He wants you to speak to that elbow and command it to be made whole. And when we, I just see so many more people get healed when we actually pray commanding prayers. If you get to a point where you don't know what to pray and it feels like, uh, nothing's happening and you need to back into that space with yourself and God pray under prayers like this don't pray out loud don't let them hear you pray out loud oh God uh, nothing's happening <laughs> uh, God I don't know what to do those types of petitionary prayers are prayed under your breath <laughs> but they need to be real if it's real be real with the Lord God I don't know what to do I'm, I'm stuck I need help show me and then listen, I prayed for a woman one time. She's blind. I prayed, I interviewed her, did all this stuff. And I, I just figured it was a natural cause. As I'm praying, I prayed four, three, four, five times. And um, we're, nothing's happening. Six people were blind, got healed that night, including a guy who had white uh, scar tissue on his eyes. Um, but this woman wasn't being healed. And then I had an impression. I, and it, I paid attention to it. So I, because I'd asked her if anything traumatic happened. She said, no, the only thing traumatic that happened in her life is her dad had died. Oh, well, it's, it's traumatic, but it's, it's not like abuse or anything. Uh, and, but then the, nothing was happening. And I felt like the Lord said, ask her more about her dad. So I said, uh, 
How close was your blindness? When did it come? How, and how close was the blindness to your dad's death? I had not asked that. And she said, instantly. I said, well, wait, wait a minute. Were you with your dad when he died? Yes. Were you touching him when he died? Yes. And you went blind as soon as he died? Yes. Now, I felt like the Lord showed me that the, her blindness was caused by an afflicting spirit that was in her father that entered her at a moment of death. So I told her, I, I felt like that was a revelation from God. And so I told her, I said, I believe that I'm going to pray for you one more time. And this time, when you open your eyes, you're going to see. So I changed my prayer. And I didn't pray for the eyes. I commanded the spirit of affliction that had entered her body when her dad died. I said, I take authority over you and I break your power. I cancel your assignment and I command you to lift off her eyes now in the name of Jesus. And when she opened her eyes, she could see. But it took a change. It was, it was, and so this prayer, diagnostic decision, and then pray for effect. Diagnostic decision and, or speak to the condition. What's wrong? Well, I, my, I don't have any cartilage. God, I, in Jesus' name, we speak regeneration of cartilage in your eyes. We call that which is not as though it was. We speak yeah. to the knee. God, create the cartilage. In Jesus' name, we bless your knee with new cartilage. And I've, I've actually seen God create cartilage. Yeah. What's the cause determines how you would address the prayer. Does that make sense? Now, if we think that 80% of all precipitating physical problems, and this is not only in the United States. I've been in many countries with a very similar number, percentage. If we think that 80% is caused by um, a, a, a wrong response to being sinned against, and we now are, have bitterness or anger or unforgiveness or, or, or consumed with jealousy, a bunch of things that are just really unhealthy, then I think it's not smart to think that 80% of what we deal with is going to be a demon. But for many people I've, I've listened to and people I've had actually in, in courses, they, their default is everything's a demon. All right, and by the way, when I'm praying against, I don't, I don't even like to use the word demon because they, they get so scared. I use the word an afflicting spirit. What's the difference? There isn't any. It's just a less scary name. But, then, but there is a difference in the way I'm approaching it. Doing deliverance is not the same as breaking the power of an afflicting spirit because the afflicting spirit is dealing with the body. When we're talking about a demonized situation, it's dealing with the soul, the area of the will, the emotion, the thought processes. And usually there is some open door that opened that up. And, it, you know, it's a different approach. Whereas in just afflicting spirit, we just deal with it in, in authority because it's not ne related necessarily to open, opening uh, something up. So interview, diagnostic decision, and pray for effect. Number three, stop and re-interview. And you may need to do that. They, it, it, if they say... I, I, I feel heat. Didn't tell, oh, that's really good. That's one of the most common things that we see. Or I feel energy. Uh, one, and, and pay attention to your own body. And pay attention to your mind. Words of knowledge are not emotional. They're rational. Or oh, I said it wrong. Words of knowledge are not based in your emotion. They're based in your thought. So if you try to work your emotions up so God will move, you get, you're, you're in a place where you can't hear him. In some, some countries where I've been, I've had to work with the church to, to convince them they don't have to work themselves into a sweat. Working your emotions up to get God to move, I don't think is wise. Amen. However, after you have prayed and God has moved, if you don't have emotions, you need to draw closer to the Lord. <laughs> Because it's a normal reaction to have some emotion. When you see God move, it's all right to be like a little child and to be excited. And, and because 
as you talk to the person you're praying for, it, you're like a midwife helping them understand the process. And you can make this easier by their having understanding. And when they see you're excited because you understand the ways of God and you understand that this is a good sign, I say, oh, this is really good. This is a good sign. This happens a lot when God is healing. I want you to know this is good. And a lot of people say, okay. And they want to walk off. I say, wait a minute, where are you going? I say, well, I'm healed. Say, well, you're not really yet. You're being healed, but you're not healed yet. He said, well, I don't want you to pray more than once. I said, well, why? Jesus did when the guy wasn't all the way healed. Don't, I, I say this, don't walk out from your anointing for healing. Stay connected. As, I, I said, listen, as long as God's moving, we want to pray. And when God's done, I'm done. Because I can't do anything. But if God's moving, you're still feeling, you're getting better. Don't, don't, don't stop. We're going we're to continue to pray. You may need to go back through, and if something's happening, watch it. if it's going well, just keep doing it. God, I bless. I bless what you're doing. Thank you, Lord. My, my, my daughter-in-law said, Randy, sometimes you've prayed for half an hour. How do you pray so long? I said, I don't use a lot of words. She said, what do you mean? I said, if I'm praying for somebody and they got a heart problem, I'll just speak some commands to the heart and you know, a little bit of intercession. You know, the Lord petition. The Lord, I ask you to come. Come, Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you. I believe you're here. Uh, Lord, I, now I speak in the authority of Jesus' name to electrical problems in his heart. His woman last night, we prayed for her. It's so exciting. I don't know if she's here or not. Her heartbeat was double. It was 127. It was racing. She couldn't sleep at night. And I took my Fitbit because I said, how, how will you know if you're better? She said, well, I don't know. She's tried to do this. And I, I'm thinking, well, you, can't, you don't even have a watch. How are you going to know if it's high or low? So I took my Fitbit off and put her arm, and it was, it was 67. No, it was 64. And, but it had been running 127. And when she saw the Fitbit, she started crying. She said, is that mine? I said, yeah, that's yours. But that's only half of what mine is. I said, yeah, no, it's not good. And, you know, something like that. She's crying. So if it's good, you don't have to be talking all the time. Here's one of the things I do in an interview. As long as my hand's on you, I'm praying for you. I may not be saying any words because prayer is just not talking. It's also listening. I believe the Holy Spirit's power can be flowing into you. And so if it's quite a while, I prayed once for a woman who's dying of fourth stage cancer. It came in 15 minutes. God was shaking and in five minutes of peace. <laughs> Here it come another wave and six of those. That's six 20-minute cycles. That's unusual, but it, it happened once, twice. And I just be there. Thank you, Jesus. And that's every, every once in a while, I'd check in. What's happening? You still feel it? Yeah. And it was, it was all over her. Every organ in her abdomen, her lungs, her bones. And, I, and we started praying. Didn't, want, didn't know where to pray. I said, Lord, I just speak to her cancer and I command it to die. God, come. Release your power. And she said, my legs are hot. So what did I do? On her femurs. I put my legs, hands on her femurs. As a matter of fact, when she got up to leave later, her pants were soppy wet in the back. Not where her butt's at, but where her leg, thighs were at. It just was wet because her bones became so hot as God was killing the cancer in her bones that it caused her to sweat in her legs. But then after a while, she said, well, now that's not, that's not where I'm feeling. She said, where are you feeling? I'm feeling in my lungs. So I just put my hands up here. And we just begin to bless. And after a while, Lord, we bless what you're doing. We bless what you're doing. Thank you, Jesus. Gratitude, thanksgiving. We bless what you're doing. And then I wouldn't say very much for a while. What's happening? Well, I still feel it. Oh, good, good. We don't quit while he's working. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, now I'm feeling it down in my stomach. Okay, let's put... God, we bless what you're doing. We bless what you're doing. Thank you, Jesus. Command that cancer to die. Command that tumor to shrink. In Jesus' name. We bless your, if, it, if, if they say it's hot, Lord, I bless your heat. If they say I feel electricity, I, God, I bless your electricity. Yeah. And what happens if they say they feel cold? Because sometimes it does appear as cold, especially if they have an infection that would cause them to feel heat. What they're feeling of coldness is the healing. How long do you do that? As long as God's blessing or they get to a point, and if, you're, if it's just one-on-one, -on -one, you do it a long time. 
But if you've got a line of 50 people, if you get to say, well, they're, they're getting better and getting better, and now they're 80%, I, I often will say, listen, I believe God wants to complete this. Why don't you go sit on the front row and stay focused and let's let God thank him for what's happening because there's more people here that we're waiting to pray for. And we have t- often on our teams, we have to pray for so many people where I said, God gave you two hands for a reason. Pray for, use your interpreter. <laughs> pray for two at a time. Ask the interpreter to find out what's wrong and start praying for that one. And then while you're praying for that, and ask the interpreter to find out what's wrong with this and then tell them, pray for that one. And while you're praying for that, now ask the interpreter to see what's going on here. Find out. And, then, <laughs> and you pray for two at once. God, you know, there'll be times God may give such a wave of healing that there's so many people that you might have to pray for two at once. Amen. God's able to do that. Amen. Amen. All right. We have talked about how to get words of knowledge. And we talked about how to pray for the sick. But what I didn't tell you is the last step. Post-prayer recommendation. Let's say that they were, there was caused by stress. And if, what, you, well, what if it is stress? Stress is one of the major killers. What do you pray? God, I bless this person with your peace. Peace is powerful. Paul Martini's got one of the best sermons I've ever heard on peace, the power of peace. Post-prayer suggestion. If they're caused by unforgiveness, tell them to guard their heart and not allow unforgiveness to come up. If it was a genetic thing, God, if we break this curse in the name of Jesus, and like for psoriasis, it's genetic. When I pray for things that are genetic, I pray like something like this. God, in the name of Jesus, I speak to their DNA, and I speak, uh, Father, to the message that's on that DNA. And God, I pray you erase that message that's broken and that you write a new message on it that gives the right message that this is healed in Jesus' name. We, 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 we write a new message on the DNA. So then post-prayer suggestion, if they're... 80% healed. And they stop there. And you don't know what else to do. Say, I don't know what else to do. But thank God for the 80%. Wrap it up in thanksgiving. Give it back to him and ask him for the rest. What if they didn't get healed at all? Two things on my team, in my church, and on around the world where we go. If you do either of these things, you will be set off of the team. And you'll have to, wait, you'll have, to have some more instruction. And by the way, you don't even get to be on our ministry team. Everybody can pray for the sick in my church, but not, you have to be, um, go through the training yeah. in a workshop. And then you're assigned to a person that's on the team already. And for six months, you stand beside that person and you watch and you listen. And then after a while, they let you start praying, but you can't walk off where they're at because they're going to be listening to how you're doing. And after six months, as they say, this person's ready to be full-blown, not just an uh, intern on the work ministry team, but they're now ready to become released. And that's what we did because we wanted to make sure and, that we had well-trained teams Amen. who were equipped. Ever, anybody in the church could become on the team, but there's a process you had to go through. Here's the two things, though, that if you did them, you people would, would say, we need to talk. And if you kept doing it, then you'd, I'd actually, I would kick you off the team. I will not allow anybody on my teams do this. You didn't get healed because you don't have enough faith. That is a no-no. Second no-no, you didn't get healed because you must have some hidden sin in your life. Now, this is what I told my team. Condemnation is general. You're bad. You're a sinner. Conviction is specific. If the Lord shows you what the hidden sin is, then quietly, just don't, don't uncover it. Don't pronounce it. Ask them a question. Dig around. Give them a chance to see the hound of heaven is on their trail and about to tree them. And uh, ask them a a related question. Do you struggle with... Have you been struggling with some sexual issues? Have you been struggling with worry and finances? Have you been, you know, have you you been... uh, Have you been, you know, whatever it would be that would be appropriate. 
But don't just say, because don't say that you've got some hidden sin. I've had people actually come to me and said, I have prayed, I've fasted, I've asked God to show me. And I, 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 I don't know, they keep telling me I must have some hidden sin in my life and I don't know what it is. I'm asking God. God is not a cruel person that will not tell you what's wrong with you when you're asking him. So avoid those two. Now, you may go to church if that's common. That's fine. I'm not telling you what to do in that church. I'm just telling you what would happen if it was on my ministry team. Because for me, those things are counterproductive. Actually, I tell you what I think it is. You're speaking for Satan, not the Holy Spirit. And they say, well, wait a minute. That's a big statement. Why? Because Satan means the accuser of the brethren. And what are you doing? You're accusing. And what happens if, let's say it's true. The person you know, they don't have any faith at all. Well, how much faith is it going to help them if you say, you didn't get healed because you don't have enough faith? They're saying, I knew I didn't have enough faith. Even the leaders of the church are telling me I don't have enough. Now I'm sure I don't have enough faith. You're just reinforcing the unbelief. Instead, I, I actually have done it. I said, listen. Prayed for somebody that didn't get healed. And I, knew, I knew they had no expectation, no understanding. Said, Listen, if I was a doctor, I'd give you a prescription. I'm a doctor of the soul. I'm going to give you a prescription right now. And I'd write down some verses about healing. I said, I want you to meditate on these verses this week. Or I'd say, listen, here's a good um, uh, teaching to listen to. I want you to listen to this. Or I'd give them a little book. Or I'd say, here's somebody that's a really good book on healing. I I'd like for you to either watch this, listen to this, read this, and come back next week and let's pray again. I didn't say you don't have enough faith. But I addressed weak faith and how to strengthen it in love rather than condemnation. Holy Spirit is the one called to your side to help you make sure that what you say reflects that role rather than the accuser's role. All right? Okay, now my team tonight is going to play the role that they did in Brazil at the Presbyterian Church. They're going to help us coach when it comes time to prayer and kind of mix in with people who may especially say, well, I've never prayed for anybody, but I'd like to get started. So we're going to put in practice. Now, to give you an idea of the power of a word of knowledge, before, we, before you give words of knowledge, just to build the faith, I want to show you the video called Rainbow Sun. It's at a Baptist church, and the reason I've had more people get healed watching this video than any video we have. We have hundreds, probably 600 videos of healings. This is the one that has the greatest diversity of problems. And as you watch it, if you have the same thing that's on the video, may it create faith in you. I could be healed I could be healed too. Excuse me. All right. You guys ready? All right. Rainbow sun. When you see somebody doing this, they're saying, I just got at least 80% better. 80% because God's in the process of healing. We find out much more what's really happened. That's why it's called rainbow sun. It was in the paper the next day. There's a rainbow when we got there around the sun. This is... One of the two times, now four, that we actually caught a healing on a video. And I'll show you the one, and you'll hear her testimony later. Uh, she had polio and couldn't get pregnant. That part you don't know about, but she got pregnant shortly afterwards. The next one. This woman's being healed right now. She's right there getting healed of polio. I want you to listen for two things. There's a word of knowledge or there was heat. Now turn it up, please. It was a tumor, not a cyst. Inside the femur. And the doctor said she had to amputate her leg. She said, I'm not amputating my leg. Jesus is going to heal me. Eight years he had severe pain on his foot, 
a pain appeared out of nowhere for eight years and he couldn't bend his knees. He couldn't walk properly. Eight years of pain. And the pain is totally gone. Hallelujah! But if it doesn't lose the pleasure. Four screws and two metal bars. Quanto tempo atrás você foi? Dois meses. Two months ago. It, it takes very strong medication to control the pain. He said he almost didn't come for to the comfort of service tonight. He was in severe pain there. He couldn't sit down. He was, couldn't stand anymore. He was almost leaving. And then you pray for people with metal on the body, and the pain is gone. He, he stood him up. Basically, he had the surgery where it wasn't pain before. He stood him up. Could not move it. She started to feel the power of God touch her over there. Now she can move her foot. Mais de quatro pés de novo. Mostra o que você não podia fazer. Vai. Não fazia esse movimento. Since May, she was diagnosed with cancer in her right breast, and the pain was so severe she couldn't raise her arm. Uh, over like more than this, and you're saying if you're uh, feeling anything, said so you didn't feel anything, but suddenly this this heat came on top of her, and then she felt like the pain was gone, and she raised her hand and she could move and wave with both hands as if she was healed. Glória a Jesus. She said the pain is very severe. She couldn't move fast enough for us, and now she can move the arms. The pain is totally gone. Praise Jesus. Deus abençoe. Keep, you gotta keep your eyes on that guy's knees. Over 20 years, he had an accident. Lost the cartilage on his knees. Could not bend, could not kneel, could not walk properly without pain. Now, do it, Brad. The pain, the pain disappeared, and now he's moving, he's bending. He said, I, I just can't do this. I don't believe this. No pain. No pain. No pain. Hallelujah. Glória a Deus. Three, three or four years ago, he was run over by a car. He was bleeding. He was bleeding. And he, since three or four years ago, he had constant pain in his back. Could not bend the back. Somebody had a word of knowledge for him, and he stood up, and the pain disappeared. Now he can bend. Não está doendo? Não. Aleluia. Glória a Deus. What's your name? Natalia. Her name is Natalia. 11 years old. Blind from birth of the right eye. Could not see a thing. Show her some fingers. How many people have seen the right eye? How many people have seen the right eye? How many people have seen the right eye? Two. Three. Four. Hallelujah! She said during prayer, she felt a lot of heat, a lot of heat all over her body. She said a lot of heat all over her body. And then suddenly she started to see with her right eye. She covered it, she checked, and she saw everything. And she's crying, she's feeling the presence of God over her. Praise the Lord. Lord of Deus. It is a good story. All the way to the background, people praying for people while this is going on. Oh my God. Oh my God. God, you should see that the eyes of the cameraman is crying. Can you? A blind eye, 11 years old girl, blind, totally blind in the right eye, totally healed, totally healed. She can see again. Jesus is fixing the eyes of the blind. This is Michelle. In March this year, she found out she had a cancer on her left breast. It was a big tumor, a big lump. She could feel it, touch and feel it. During press, somebody had a word of knowledge for cancer in the left breast. And just, just she wasn't feeling anything, just to check if it was her. She went and touched it and it wasn't there anymore. It totally disappeared. And with it went the pain. She said, the moment I went to go re 
Secret Story, the main and the, the girl disappeared. Passou que também chegou? This is what God is doing here in Brazil. You have to come and witness for yourself. You have to come give Jesus the chance to use your hands to heal and make cancer disappear. This lady had cancer in her breast. And you can see the emotion in her eyes and how God has touched her. She is totally cancer free. Jesus is alive and well and doing miracles all over the world. God bless you. This is your son. Hallelujah. Vamos na casa curada em nome de Jesus. During the word of... <laughs> During the time of word of knowledge, somebody said, there's somebody with a cast. There's somebody with a cast. That, that was the word of knowledge. So here's the somebody with a cast, and here's the cast. What's her name? Ivana. She said she had a strong case of tendonitis. She went to the doctor. She could not stand the pain she was going through. The doctor put this cast on her hand said, don't even think of moving your fingers or your arm. Just rest. Stay home and rest. She said, no way. I'm going to church. I'm going to get my healing. She came tonight. Somebody said, I see a cast. She said, when the lady said that, I said, that's my cast and I'm healed. And then the pain totally disappeared. And she said she couldn't, she couldn't touch her skin before. It was so much pain that she couldn't touch the skin. Now she can touch. She can move. The pain is gone. Você sentiu a presença de Deus? Sim. O que você está sentindo agora? Muita alegria no meu coração. She said she's so happy. She's just joyful. The pain is gone. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. Glory to Jesus. Jennifer. Jennifer. All right, guys. This is Jennifer. And she was born with blindness on the right eye. She could not see out of this eye at all. She could not see at all. Now, cover, cover this eye. And read from you what's the sign saying there, Lila. Melhor é o fim das coisas do que o princípio. She's reading the sign that she she was totally blind in the eye, and she's reading. She was blind, now she's reading. First she was blind, now she's reading. Hallelujah! Glory to God! Oh man, this is so awesome. Just briefly, I want to tell you one other thing about this video. We go to that church a lot. It's a, it's a Baptist church. We've grown from the first time we went there, it was 300, then it went to 3,000, went to 9,000, then it went to 23,000. Um, it, we've seen so many miracles there. But there used to be another story after that one. It was a man who was quadriplegic, couldn't move his fingers, couldn't move his toes from uh, last stages of MS did not want to be prayed for, but his wife asked me if I'd pray for him and his son. And we went and we began to pray for him. And um, he began to get feeling in his fingers and he got to where he could move his fingers up a little bit. And then when he went like that, able to lift his arm, he, you could see excitement starting to happen. And got a team, we're praying for his back. He had a lot of pain, praying for his legs. And one of the other things I never, unless I heard the Lord tell me to, not because of a pattern. I, I never pull anybody out of a wheelchair. Because I've prayed for so many people in wheelchairs. It's been pulled out so many times. They don't want to be pulled out of the wheelchair one more time. It's like, this is what you do. You pull them out. If God tells you to, you do it. And if God told you to and you do it, they'll walk. If you do it and they don't walk, God didn't tell you to. It's that simple. Anyway, but here's what I found out. When people that are in a wheelchair begins to feel God touching them, they want to get out and try to walk. You don't have to pull them out. They'll ask you to help them out. And uh, we watched him begin to move his feet, watch him begin to move his knees like this, and pull his feet up, and then he said, I want to try to walk. And he walked from about here to the clock and back and walked out. Amen. But we go back there so often, we double-checked on all those healings to find out if they lasted. His didn't last. Lasted about six months, then he got sick with something else, and then the MS came back. We sent a team to his house to pray for him. He was unable to move anything below his neck again about a year or so later. His legs begin to move, and then he says, I don't want to go through this again. I don't want to get disappointed again. I want you to stop. Don't, don't pray for me anymore. But because we knew the healing didn't last, we cut it out. We don't show it. But all the others, years later, they're still healed. And the one woman who had the polio, we found out later, she was barren, couldn't get pregnant. And within just a few months afterwards, she got pregnant and had a baby. Did you notice in the, the video how often they said there's a word of knowledge? 
And some of them, just as soon as the word of knowledge came, they got healed before there was a prayer for them. Quite a few of them. The boy, the little boy that had been run over, the, the woman that had the tumors, as soon as she went to look for it, it was gone. She hadn't even been prayed for yet. And the, did, you, did you notice that several of them said there was this heat, like the little 11-year-old girl, there's this heat, and then she could see. Others the same. So, now, are you ready? Everybody stand up and check your body out and see if anybody got healed. Just watching the video, and if you did, I want you just, you don't have to come forward, just wave both hands over the head. Because I believe some of you got healed, and if you'll just check it out, you'll find out that there's a, at least 80% better. And if it's that case, it's you, wave both hands over your head. Both hands. One hand is I'm better, but two hands is I'm at least 80% better. And that's what we're looking for. Not a confession, but a manifestation of at least 80%. So if it's at least 80%, weigh both hands. There's one uh, back there, healed, watching the video. Check it out. I think there will be two more that will, um, I think. I, mean, I don't know if there's not, and I miss the Lord, but I just felt like there will be two more. I want to wait 30 seconds. Check it out. Try to move more. Just don't over. I see him. I got him. Yes, thank you for helping me there. Anybody else, check it out. Don't just check once, twice, three times. If you're at least 80%, do both hands. There's a second, and there's the third. I felt there. Now, there it's starting. There's the fourth. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. All right. You may be seated. Every time I do this teaching in the schools that we do, I, I take and I pray, and I'm going to pray a prayer of activation because God told John Wimber that one of the things he's going to use me for when I travel the nations was to activate people and gifts. So I'm going to pray, and you don't have to do anything. As a matter of fact, if you strive to get a word, it's, all, it's harder. It's kind of like, Lord, here's what I do. Lord, I'm paying attention. If you give me a word, I'll give it. And I don't try to get them. I just pay attention if I'm receiving one, and then I give it. Father, in the name of Jesus, I bless the men and women and seated in this place. And I call forth in Jesus' name by the Holy Spirit gifts of words of knowledge to come to them. That the, these gifts would be released and they would have for the first time or at least this kind of a word for the first time. And so, Father, in Jesus' name, we surrender these next two minutes to you as you release words of knowledge. Amen. Now, just stay focused. Pay attention to your body. The moment you think... God has given you a word of knowledge. You're not sure, but you think God has given you a word of knowledge for a physical condition or somebody's name who has a physical condition. This is not a time for prophecy. <laughs> it's not a prophetic conference. I want you to come to the front. And we'll wait two minutes. No, I'm going to wait two minutes. If you think you have one, go ahead and come up. Never had a word of knowledge before this way. Never had a word of knowledge in this manner. And that, and that goes for my team. If you get a word of knowledge like you've never had before, then you're on level ground for everybody else. <laughs> but when we start praying for the sick, I want you to be coaches tonight. One more minute. My friend, my spiritual son, Will Hart, makes me nervous on this. He actually will say, if you think there's a 2% chance you could be right, come on up and give it. And I think, oh, that makes me nervous. <laughs> Here's the thing. If you don't 
try, you won't know if that is God or not. Normally in church, this is not a normal church service. This is a clinic. We're giving you permission to try, giving you permission to fail. If you're wrong, don't feel bad about it. You learn something. You learn, well, that wasn't the Lord. Now, it's going to be very important. If they are right, you stand up immediately. And then after you stand up and they, we see you, then you can sit back down. Somebody can fill in here if you want, make a little more room. Okay, now, remember, this is their first time to give a word like this, this kind of a word of knowledge, this, this one of the seven ways. They've never had this before. So they're all risking. So if you have it, you should stand up for long enough that the they can see you and they'll know they're right. Second thing is, I want you, it's your responsibility to remember who calls out what you have. Don't come up to me later and say, who was it that had that? I don't know. You only got to remember one person. <laughs> you know, so pay attention to who it is so you can go to them. We will pray one prayer afterwards to see some of you will be healed just by that prayer. If you're not 100% healed, you're about 80%. You will get that. But even if you're not, you come to them and, and get prayer. Okay, William, go ahead and start. You want them to give this the one strongest word? or mm, No, just, okay. because this, they've never had a word like this before. Okay. Uh, I just heard the word spinal stenosis. All right. I believe there's somebody got to have spinal stenosis here. Yes. Thank you, God. Um, I saw a baby being birthed, but uh, the opening was too small. Okay. If, wait, wait, wait a minute. If there's anything related to that pertains to you or a child you had, uh, then go ahead and stand up. Maybe you were the child. Maybe there was traumatic birth. Uh, uh, but if that, re if that relates to you, just stand up for a, a moment and then you can be seated. Okay? All right. I saw an apple in the location of the throat, so I think something with regard to someone's Adam's apple. All right. Anybody have a problem that, and, and my, here's the other thing. If you have a problem, but you're not having it right now, but it comes and goes, you have that problem. Now, we wouldn't know if you were healed or not, except you can get healed and never have it again. So you should still get, stand up and get prayer for it if you have a problem in the area where your Adam's apple would be. Okay. I had a pain from, from right back here. Went down the back of my shoulder and down part of my arm. And when I asked the Lord if that was something, all of a sudden the pain went away and my head was like, felt really good. <laughs> so I don't know. Okay. Anybody have a problem? You get pain in that area where she said, uh, on the left side. Yeah. Three, four, five. Yeah. All right. Thank you. God. I had a pain in my right ear, and I heard the Lord say to me, someone's having trouble hearing out of their right ear. Okay. Who has hearing loss or problem in the right ear? Okay. We got four. Thank you, God. Five. So I was just given the name Angela. All right. Is there an Angela here that has a physical need? Okay. All right. Yes. I saw water level going down and then a man in a blue shirt bending his left arm. Does that make sense to anybody? Does anybody have a problem in, uh, in the left arm? You have a problem in the left arm. We may not understand. Sometimes we don't understand everything, and sometimes we misinterpret. Sometimes it's two words put in to put together. Yeah, All right. Yeah. Uh, I saw. Uh, I believe it was a right hand opening and closing. It had a a class ring on the index finger, and it was opening and closing on something hard and metallic. I think it was gold in color. Okay. Was it, which hand was it? I think it was the right hand. Okay, does anybody have a problem with the right hand? 
Something not fun. There's man over there. Right hand problem. Okay. I felt uh, like a throbbing pain in the right hip. All right. Anybody relate to that throbbing pain in the right hip? Three, four, five, six, seven. All right. I saw someone uh, lose their balance, and I believe that they fell toward the, the right side. Um, either they were pushed or lost their balance. Okay. So you had a fall to the right side, okay? Lost it. Four. Thank you, God. Um, I just had a vision of somebody's right wrist, uh, specifically, I guess, the right hand uh, moving around and another right like wrist. Like what you're doing? Yeah, like what I'm doing, yeah. Okay. Anybody identify with this? There's something that wrong. Maybe that hurts you to do that. Okay. couple? I had two things. One was the left ovary has a humongous tumor or a cyst. And the second was a liver issue, an okay. infection of some sort. All right. You don't have to, you could have both, but you don't have to have both because it could be two separate words of knowledge for two different individuals. It, it could also be just one person has both. So we, we don't want to narrow, too narrowly define it. Does it make sense to one of them for you, one of them for you? Do, does it, do either of you have both of those conditions or anybody here have both of those conditions? Okay. So it's... It's two different things. I had a vision of Jesus, and uh, there was an owl over his face, and I, I just feel like maybe owl will mean something to you. I know. Oh, yeah. Um, and I also had this sensation of being choked. Um, either you're feeling it right now, or it, sometimes you feel like you're being choked in the throat. You don't have to stand for yeah. that one. Yeah, two. Three, four. What about the owl in the sense of in the front of faith, Jesus' face? Does that make sense? Does the Holy Spirit give you the interpretation and know whether or not that would be you? Sometimes we get things, but we don't understand what we see. But the Holy Spirit will interpret it to the person and they understand. Said, well, that uh, was for me. Okay. All right. Does that make sense? Yes, a couple. Um, I felt a pressure right behind, right here behind the eye, and then it kind of radiates down. It's like it's almost hard to open my right eye. Okay, pressure and pain, pressure behind the right eye. Who has a problem with, like, pressure behind the right eye? Where's Jamie? Oh, okay. All right. I saw three things. One was the name John. The other thing I saw was a big tire uh, of the truck, bus, I'm sorry, which had crushed the right femur. And the third thing I saw was the second and the third toe, there's a lot of itching and probably eczema. Okay. Is there any uh, one of those things that you identify with? I have one of those, or maybe you have more than one, but is there, is there um, a... I know there's a John here because I signed two John's <laughs> books today. Uh, but is there a John here who has a problem? You don't have to have necessarily one of those two problems, but your name is John and you have a physical problem. Okay, there is. What about, okay, what about the, the, the femur uh, problem? Does anybody have a, a damage to the femur? Yes. Okay, what about the problem... The, on the, what is it, second and third toe? Yeah. Second and third toe. On the top of the foot. On the top of the foot. Oh. Who has, okay, there's two, two has that. I always wondered which is the second, the second one next to the little toe or the second one next to the big toe? <laughs> and the, the next to the big toe, okay. <laughs> and the middle toe would be the same, all right. I, I felt heat uh, on my right ear. All right. I felt heat on my right ear. All right, somebody has something wrong with the right ear, a problem in the right ear. Was there a word about that a while ago? Okay, yes, there's two, all right? Someone's right knee, my knee is really hurting a lot, so someone's right knee. Okay, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, there's like pain right, right here, and it's almost like a stiff neck knot, and I believe it... The name Rich came when I asked the Lord who. Okay. 
Is your name Rich? Okay. Do, would you happen to also have that? Got both of them. Yes. That ought to double your faith. <laughs> and you have the pain there. Okay. All right. I heard two names very clearly, almost like he'd say to somebody like, okay, you got the first one, you got the second one, maybe two people. But then later I heard it together. So I heard Robert James. So Robert James here. Is there a Robert here? There's a Robert. Two Roberts. And your brother's name is James. Okay. Robert in the back, do you have any connection to the James part as well? Your brother. They got two people. She heard it twice. Robert, James. Both of you should come up to get prayer from Robert. <laughs> felt a sharp uh, sciatica pain in my right leg. I also heard the name Jennifer. Okay. Is there a Jennifer here? Some person, her name is Jennifer. Oh, the, the lady back there. The lady back there. And what was the other? Oh, uh, sciatica. Do you have any issue with sciatica? Right Your daughter leg. has sciatica. All right, and these two that just stood up, you have the sciatica issue, okay? Three, four, all right? Just a sharp pain in the back of the ankle or the, the foot back here. I'm trying to show you, but I can't stand up. Right here. Okay, there's a right foot near the heel, right above the heel, near the Achilles tendon. The pain, okay, she has it. Thank you. Uh, she has it. Thank you, Lord. So I have uh, kind of three different words, um, and I'm going on a limb here with the first one. I saw it looked like a neon sign of a bar or something like that, and it had like this wave on it, and it was like blue and purple. And I felt like there was something, maybe an accident related to that, or perhaps an alcohol addiction. I don't know. I don't want to, you know, but if that means anything to you, to anyone here, um, yeah, I'm not sure. But the other one I heard was shingles. Okay. Okay. Um, and the third one, I saw this like front house and the front door and a, and a way, like a pathway to it. And there was an accident there. Um, and um, maybe a name Milo or Millie associated with that. Okay, is there anybody that has Millo or Millie in your name? Even a nickname. All right, what about the, uh, was it a brown house you said? Well, no, it's like a, um, like a one-story, I think, house. Okay. Um, and there was an accident, almost like a fall, but somebody had fall to the, to the right. It was more like fall to the left, that's what I felt. A fall. Yeah. Okay. So anybody, that makes sense. You had a fall, and if you can reflect back, you may have been in front of a single-story house when you fell. Okay. Uh, I was feeling a pain right here on the left jaw. Um, and I was hearing the names Cynthia and Doug. Okay. Let's start to each of those. Was it the bottom, the whole jaw, or the back of the jaw? Just top right or here on the top, bottom. On the, what is that? Like right in the corner where the muscle is. Yeah. The jaw. There's a name for that muscle. I'm not sure the name of it. Okay. Right, right at the end of the jaw, bottom. Bottom of the jaw. All right. He has it. All right. And somebody else over here. Okay. Um, I heard the name Andrew, and then uh, the number 1567. I don't know if they are related, but one came after the other. So, Okay, let's start with the name Andrew. Is there an Andrew here? Okay, does, does the number 1567 mean anything to this Andrew? Okay, does the numbers 1567 mean anything to anybody here? The numbers one five six seven. That's 
Okay. I have the same feeling as that woman right there in the green shirt, right here on somebody's bone. I've been feeling it all night. It hurts and it goes down to here. Pain. Does that make sense to anyone? Pain on, you said the left, the left, left side? Left shoulder. Left shoulder goes down goes through down the left to, to the elbow or? No, right to here. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, okay, awesome. Amy and hairdresser may or may not be related. Do we have an Amy? Okay, awesome. And a hairdresser? Okay, but you are a hairdresser. You, Amy? Awesome, okay. Um, the name Joan and something going on in the head. I, I couldn't tell it felt lightheaded, then it felt a little bit of pain. Weird things going on in the head. Okay, do we have a Joe? Joe. Does both of those relate to you? Joe. It does? Oh, I heard the name Joan. Joan. Well, yeah. it was, we <laughs> interpret it as Joe, right? <laughs> awesome. Uh, the name Ralph and chronic pain, and, and it may be somebody that's not here. Somebody here knows Ralph. Okay. Does that mean anything to anyone? Is there a Ralph in the room? Anyone with chronic pain? Okay, Dr. Clark. Oh. Yeah, I'm experiencing pain right here on top of my head, and it extends down to my forehead, like over the eye. Um, and uh, I also had uh, a word about a creative miracle. Of that particular pain that he talked about. Okay, he does. Any, uh, he has titanium implants on both sides of his ears, so I was praying for a creative miracle last night for him, and also uh, someone else said a word about creative miracle. Okay. Yeah, I heard. Um, one more. Um, William, over here. Right here. Um, I'm giving this on behalf of a team member. She saw a picture of a, a testicle, and then it's turned into a fiery heart. So I don't know if that. So if that means makes sense anything, to you, sense to you don't have to stand. But if that makes sense to you, <laughs> come up and let let him pray for you. Now, now I want to say something. I didn't. I in my church. Oh, you got another? Okay. Oh, okay. Just the name Jack. Okay. There's someone here goes by the name Jack. Is there a Jack here? You have any name Jack? Okay, there is. All right. All right. As a pastor, what do I do on a Sunday morning if someone gives a word and no one responds to it? I would do this. I'd say... Is anybody here that you have a family member that has that condition or friend and you know, you know someone personally that's got exactly that condition? And if so, you should encourage them, tell them about the word, even call them and involve them in, in the prayer we're about to pray or if they're not home, go and pray for them. If no one responds to that, then I often will say, and this is the truth, it's not a cop-out, because every, when we had visitors come that were not used to this, they almost never would stand up. But they would come up afterwards, after it's all over, and most of the people had gone. They said, did anybody come up for that? I had that, but I, I was too embarrassed to stand up. So, so I let the people know that sometimes the person's there, but they're, this, they're not used to this, and, and they come up later. And... Then I say to the church, of, I say, now listen, no one responded in any way to this word. Remember it. God could be setting us up for a divine appointment this week, and you will hear somebody say exactly, they have exactly what was given, and so it's in the setting up a divine appointment. And you tell them, my pastor told me to be looking for this. We had a word about this. Let me pray for you. We believe it's for you. And the last thing I would say 
afterwards was sometimes we just miss and we don't get it right. But it's, that's less than what it sometimes appears at first because of these other circumstances. Okay? That's the way I pastor it. Now, if you had any of those words, please stand up. The word is God's will. He wants to do it. It's his will to do it tonight. He's looking for the amen. And so I'm just curious before we pray, try to check it out. See if you're already healed because you can be. And we see that all the time. People getting healed at least one or two before there's a prayer. Check it out. And if you are at least 80% better because of a word that they gave, wave both hands over your head. Check it out. And we got one. Thank you, Lord. Check it out. Okay, I want to pray for Put your hand where you need the healing. And if it's muscular, skeletal, begin or um, something that's not working right, just begin to check it out. Try to do something you can't do. That's important. Try to do what you can't. In the authority of Jesus' name, I bless your bodies. I bless your neck. I bless your arm. I bless your shoulder. Bless the area, the temp temporal area. Bless your eyes. Lord, that pain in the neck, pain in the back, the stenosis, the spinal stenosis, God, we pray that the fire of God would go into the spine and it would ream out the, the buildup of the, uh, the uh, calcification around the spine in Jesus' name. Lord, we speak to the pain in the top of the head, the pain in the back, and the pain into the, in the stomach area in Jesus' name. Lord, Release your healing virtue in the authority of Jesus' name. We speak healing. We speak healing to wrists. We speak healing to hands. We speak healing to the um, down around the Achilles tendon. We speak healing into the low back, uh, in, into the, that, just to that area to the right, in a, uh, in the, underneath the clavicle, in Jesus' name. God, we bless them. We speak healing to the left shoulder in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. God, we bless John's and we bless something James. Robert James, the two Robert James that make sense, God, to those two guys. Whatever it's in them needs healing, God, we, we just speak healing to the, the two men whose names Robert and their brothers are named James. In Jesus' name, healing to their condition they need. In the name of Jesus. God, we thank you in advance. Amen. Now check out your bodies. If you're at least 80% better, weigh both hands over your head. Here's one. Two. Check them out. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Three. Thank you, Lord. Four. Five. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Six. Thank you, Father. Seven, thank you, Father. All right. Now, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. You remember who prayed for you? If you're not 100%, if you wave because you're already 80%, uh, we won't clap twice. We don't want to miscount. We don't want to exaggerate or expand. But you can celebrate if you go from 80 to 100 and uh, just celebrate without clapping. But those of you that were not able to wave your hands, both 80%, when you come up for prayer, after prayer, if you're able, the person has got to ask you, you, can, you, you know, you can't let them go back after you pray. You just can't pray and then let them go. You ask them, how much better are you? And if there's no improvement, okay, if they're better, pray again. But when they're at least 80%, the person... And the person who prays together in unison, clap your hands as loud as you can. If they don't get red, you didn't clap loud enough. It's a sign. It's an acknowledgement that the healing took place. Now, you can come up now to the person who called out your condition. And at, once they get up here, you guys can start praying immediately as soon as they get to you. Those of you who came tonight 
And you wanted to be prayed for for healing, but there's no word of knowledge for you. In a moment, I'm going to have you stand up. I'm going to ask those that's seated around you for at least one of them to take the lead and do what we just said. Ask them, interview, find out what's wrong, speak to the condition, diagnostic decision, speak to the condition, stop, re-interview, and the last is post-prayer suggestion. So come on up, get in line.